create ambient energy, but we still need those materials in the asteroid belt to build a spaceship. Yeah, so we got to do that as quick as we can before we start building robots that start taking away those jobs because then that's a lot of people. And it's just, trust me, <laughs> make make the better decision now as grandparents so that 20 years, 40 years from now, everything's okay. People were like, what? So you need universal basic income because robots are coming and automation's coming. So automation's coming and eliminating white collar jobs. So blue collar jobs are still around because you don't have robots to replace them. So the robots are coming. So make the better decisions now as grandparents in terms of policy to protect humanity and your workforce. So 20 years from now, 40 years from now, you're ready. That's good governance. So you have to use universal basic income. You have to realize that automation's coming and stripping away all those white collar jobs. AI programs better than programmers. Explain it again, like literally Silicon Valley. Like I don't, I don't know why these dudes aren't thinking. It's all in Silicon Valley. When AI comes, it's doing a doctor job better than a doctor. It's doing a programmer job better than a programmer. And it'll start doing finance better than a finance person. And AI will start doing operations better than an operations person. All those white collar jobs are gone. AI will start being better professors and instructors. It'll last forever. Or it even might come to a point where the AI model can have a, this incredible machine learning mechanism where if it reads enough of like Martin Luther King's literature, it can like almost recreate what Martin Luther King is as a digital version of AI of himself. You can get to that point too. Once it reads enough of, once an AI, once, once you can program an AI to basically read as much Martin Luther King as it can, and then just replicates them. And he becomes like his own, I don't know what it'll be, but it's coming super fast. So we're going to have AI be better instructors, better teachers, with precision and nothing else. An AI that can recite and go through all of art history without any kind of biases or anything in the way of blocking it. Giving you like, I'm, I'm it's just, it's just a better instructor. It's giving you a, a digital AI instructor for whatever field that is without any of the biases or racism built in. It'll replace all universities, all those old hats, all those old hats that have money, universities, they're all gone. See what I'm saying? But AI comes from all those white collar jobs. Like the fact that an AI programmer can, AI can program better than a programmer is already, that's the game changer. I was trying to warn these guys, hey look, once the US government starts ramping up their AI, uh, it's gonna be a lot of for defense. But what is defense? Uh, it's offense and defense capabilities. Every single time. It's like a hubris of humanity. So when you have AI start designing weapons, that's when it starts getting bad and people need to be warned. That's why you need stronger AI legislation in place. Because governments are gonna weaponize AI and ask and create AI to start creating weapons. Because people don't understand. All these blue collar jobs are gonna disappear in like 40 years because robots are coming. Literally, we're ramping up easily $500 billion across all different industries to advance robotics here in the United States. One, you can use robotics, robotic humanoids and other tripods and other quadrupods to then robots to then mine the asteroid belt more safely, of course, and safety in mind. But in the meantime, I still would think those dudes on the ground that are, you know, they're hardcore miners doing coal and gas and all that, oil, all their jobs are gone because we're gonna create unlimited energy. But now we just need resources. Well, we still need your skills and material science to um, to mine the asteroid belt. So get on those jobs as soon as you can. They're worth millions because if you're going out into space, you could die. And coming back and, of course, dying again. So there's a huge risk. But I know that when you present someone with $3.4 million, $7 million, they're going to take that $7 million contract for one year or that $3 million contract for one year because you're going to space, flying out 40 days, mining the asteroid belt, and then flying back 40 days with our ion engines on our spacecraft. And the U.S. is going to be ahead of everybody else. And as everyone looks at the U.S., like, the U.S. is mining from, like, patrillions, not a gajillion, patrillions of tons of titanium and gold and steel and uh, everything. <laughs> it has, um, what's it called? Oh, my God. Uh, the asteroid belt has an, has an unlimited supply, not unlimited supply, the set amount of, well, patrillions of, like, gold, titanium, steel, jade, everything, iron ore, everything. So we're gunning for it. So the U.S. government is already going to start pretty much building spacecraft, sending them to space as quick as they can, 
to mine the asteroid belt so we can start building bigger space stations, more shipyards in space, some battle stations, and also start designing like landing sites. <laughs> you know, probably the ocean. The ocean, if you build floating cities or floating airports in the ocean or floating space docks, it's probably a safer area. Sorry, marine life. Sorry, marine life. But uh, it just makes more sense <laughs> than having large aircraft disturb uh, you know, uh, United States airspace. So really the Pacific is the perfect area to have for the Rockies. I know it sounds kind of fucked up, but the Rockies are these massive zone, massive mountains, massive, you know, massive mountains. We can like carve out like three massive shipyards. You know, the reason you might deem that, people are like, what? Why are you destroy the Rockies? Hear me out. The reason you have to destroy the Rockies and build three massive shipyards and build massive spacecraft. Um, and probably probably enough to have like 60 spacecraft. You probably don't need just three. But you have three massive shipyards that can produce 20 ships each each year. Um, the reason you need that is just in case something happens to the planet, we have the means capability to evacuate everyone from the planet. You know what I mean? And people are like, what? If we operate fast enough, if we build fast enough, we can get our drones and humans 40 days on a, on a vector engine that has an ion or vector thrust ion engine that has these unlimited fuel cells from fusion generation tech. We can get you to the asteroid belt in 40 days. We can mine the asteroid belt with drones and with humans in spacesuits and bring back all that gold ore, titanium, everything is in those asteroids. The guts of blown up, the guts of Molten stars that blew up other planets that shifted and flown through space for eons, uh, tens of millions of years until they settled, hundreds and hundreds of millions of years until they settled, to billions of millions of years, they settled in their position now. Um, but in them are the resources we need to start building more space stations, to house human colonies in space, and start building more space stations, more shipyards, and of course more battleships, and civilian transportation. But at the same time, we can also utilize the Rockies, I'm sorry. And build three shipyards that can produce 20 ships each each year and have set aside half of them for the U.S. government so that we can also have our military shipyards too and um, for defense of aerospace and space um, uh, in the stratosphere defense too uh, and in case something happens to the planet like a massive asteroid that hit the planet we have a shipyard where at least people can evacuate to and we could try to get hundreds of millions of people off the planet. And it'd be best if you start building these three massive shipyards and destroy the Rockies, these three massive shipyards to also build three massive kind of ships too. People are like, well, how are you going to leave the atmosphere? Well, uh, ion engines, baby. Uh, thrust ion engines. You could literally just float off of the fucking Earth like a Star Wars sound. <laughs> um, so, yeah. But it does take time to heat up those engines. People are like, what? So you have to juice up the, the fuel cells um, with enough energy, or they produce enough ions, and they will, because the ions are just generating. So the ship can be docked and be locked into its place, and as these massive ion engines turn on, they're like, they look like in, the, in Star Wars. <laughs> they're uh, a neon blue uh, radiated kind of ionic energy, and it's really incredible. You, they, they don't, they, it's it's an ionic um, uh, cold plasma. Cold plasma, the ionic flame, doesn't harm human skin. <laughs> It's incredible, but with enough of it, uh, a high enough concentration, uh, it can move an object infinitely and increase in speed. We did it with our satellites. We put ion engines on our satellites. It has uh, solar cells on it, and as they fly through space, they just continue to get faster and faster and faster and faster and faster because the ions just keep generating force. So there's no resistance, but it just keeps flying faster and faster and faster. So here on Earth, people are like, well, how are you going to escape the gravity? Oh, my bad. That has to do more with creating anti-gravity. But I'll save that for later. Well, I already did in a previous video. I did it in a previous video explaining about what we want about anti-gravity. Um, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah it's, it's, it, oh, it's quite incredible. People are like, oh, okay. I'll explain it again. Because I already said it once before. First core on all known planets. Have a nickel molten core. That is you know, flipping on itself. It's a ferrous material. As it flips on itself, the crust is shifting. Whole sections of molten core is rotating. The ferrous material is all metal, liquid, spinning. And the gravitational field keeps folding upon itself. And the next layer of molten uh, heat is resisting against the, re the other layer of resisting 
that is condensed down based on uh, how much negative ion and positive ions are collapsing upon themselves. And those negative and positive ions, as they bend, create a magnetic field. And people are sitting here wondering, why doesn't the air, why isn't nothing floating around? Gravity is negative ions that are collapsing and positive ions that are pushing away. Because if you shoot enough positive ions, what happens? The object starts pushing away from Earth. Why would you shoot out a whole bunch of positive ions in a cold, pl in a, in a cold plasma flame? A whole bunch of positive ions start floating away from the Earth. The negative ions are collapsing upon themselves. There's gravity. But it's not gravity. It's the negative and positive ions pushing against themselves. And the ferrous material creates a field, and that's your magnetic field. There's two currents. Why are there two currents? Because negative falls, negative ions, and positive ions fl uh, uh, fly. But they're not flying. A positive ion looks like an air bubble uh, going through water. A positive ion looks like, a, like an air bubble flowing through water. The water is the negative ions collapsing upon themselves. So our planet core is molten mag magnetic metal spinning. And as it's flipping, different layers of the crust are resisting that magnetic pull. Because they're all shifting in different directions. They're molten. And the molten are not solid. So gravitational field kind of denses and bends and warps. The metal is molten. As gravity shifts through molten metal that's just like bright yellow, it warps the gravity through the metal that's molten. But only the two ferrous materials create a positive and negative force. Negative ions and negative force fall. Positive force, positive ions rise. Your air molecules have positive and negative ions. Your objects have positive and negative ions. Every little thing has positive and negative ions. What do they look like? Electrons. But they're bound because the neutron is heavier. The neutrons and the protons are heavier and they're negative. And the positive ions are pulling out. And it's falling. Why is it falling? Because negative ions fall and positive ions float. That's gravity. So when you create a device, that'll create a magnetic field around itself. You can easily do it with magnetics, with any kind of magnet, and any kind of coil. You can wrap it around any kind of metal device and control the current and the arc of the energy through it to create a magnetic field. And with the, your mini magnetic field, you can pump that magnetic field with a ton of fucking positive ions. And there's your anti-gravity, and then it'll propel anything away from the Earth. Because it does it, because it's, it's the binding force of nature itself resonates and they go in the opposite direction. Like positive ions look like a water, like an air bubble going through water. It can't resist its natural force. That's it. And then what you do is with a plasma fan, a fusion generator engine into a vector thrust engine, you can then direct and control the complexity and intensity of the ionic blast. You can increase its power. Once you have an unlimited power source, you create fusion energy. This is a limited power source for these. This is like fusion cells. And we can generate enough energy for you to float on your skateboard, have floating shoes, have flying cars. Humans are stupid. We already found unlimited energy. Here, I'll give you why they're fucking up. Everyone's fucking up. Everyone's fucking up. They kept thinking, okay, we have unlimited energy. Man, we don't have a battery to store it all. We don't need the battery. The whole point of the magnetic field is to shoot out as much positive electrons because it can't burn anything. It's great. Cold plasma doesn't burn anything. It's fucking incredible. Literally, the engines will have, uh, you can do it with glass filaments. Or you can have, uh, actually, those don't even need it. <laughs> you don't need glass filaments. You just need metal wafers. Mm -hmm. yeah, engines will look like they are in Star Wars. They were correct. The artists were correct. They're just wafers. Imagine like an ice cream wafer or ice cream sandwich. You'd have like 100 ice cream sandwiches. Each of the materials is... Uh, the binding neon composite. Well, 
holy shit. Here's the problem. People keep thinking as, uh, they keep thinking things in gaseous forms. It's not, a, it's not a gas. We're literally pushing the existing ions that are everywhere. That's why ion engines work in space. That's why ion engines work here on Earth. People don't understand. <laughs> oh, my bad, my bad. I'll show you this. Uh, really quick. Ion engine... Uh, uh, earth flight. Oh, my bad. Oh, there it is. Wait. Oh, so, this is why ion engines work. Because the ions themselves are During pushing the everything that's material. The air itself has materials. You're literally pushing the negative of the ions that exist in the air and everywhere and in space. Because guess what gravity is? It's the falling density of negative ions. To protect babies against RF so all we're doing is we're finding his energy signature and we're resonating off of it with a positive ion. To meet your baby. No, you've helped protect them against RF beams. Okay. A grease bone uh, is not for uh, everyone. Uh, it may not protect all the babies of vaccinated mothers. Don't get a grease bone. You've had a severe allergic reaction to the grease bone. People with a weakened immune system may have a decreased response. And those positive ions are electromagnetic radiation from dense. We try and bounce off everything, like light bounces on everything. Every breath and it keeps going. Talk it keeps rising away. Or other healthcare provider like about water. Pfizer's maternal RSA like vaccine and water. a grease bone. Yeah. It's going to be incredible. The only difference is that the fusion cell, <laughs> moving energy that tight, of course, is. Uh, not saying everyone's racing to the clock, but do it 13, 17 years. 17 years away, it's 13 years ago. They diminish our attack. You can go from the warehouse. It's so, like bigger than a restaurant. And a, like, a big, uh, warehouse to a grocery store, grocery store to a restaurant, restaurant to a human house, human house to a car, car to a cell phone. So eventually, we'll diminish our attack to where a fusion cells like the size of a cell phone. They have like eight of them under the vehicle, you know, during the power. To lift you up, and like your car or vehicle can have the density of the fusion cell, a bunch of them can go vertical, you know, probably fit like 2,000 fusion cells in the vehicle, or 1,000 fusion cells, or 100 fusion cells, probably 100 fusion cells, you just want like a two person vehicle that floats, flies, and like 200 cells for like a four person vehicle, and then just upgrade from there because they person vehicle, 800 cells, and 200 to every two fusion cells. I don't know if it's four persons to eight hundred cells, probably. Turn the energy up. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and then you can imagine even a battleship. It's really small. Imagine a car with like, 2,000 fusion cells. And you can lift four people plus cargo. You just need to strap like that and that to uh, uh, 300 personnel or 5,000 personnel. And the ships themselves, their fusion cells, will be the engine rooms. So essentially, the are power. Or just power rooms. Engine rooms, you then can just you use scale configures. What? The vector plus engines, you just have more of them and bigger versions of them to get more uh, the surface area ions out. So that's why they'll literally look like a, like a satellite. You take a satellite dome and you can have wafers behind them of uh, nitrogen and oxygen. And the filament gates that make up the material itself will have uh, titanium steel alloy. This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Skillshare, home to over 20,000 classes that can teach you a new life skill. Last month, MIT revealed their ion-propelled plane, the product of seven years of development and the first of its kind. A plane capable of sustained, powered flight with no moving parts in its propulsion system. Just as the Wright brothers announced to the world that powered flight was possible, this flight lays down a milestone for ion drive technology that could pave the way to future investments and development. It has the potential to drastically improve propulsion technology. Having no moving parts is a benefit that cannot not be understated. Parts can be made lighter as they no longer need to survive the stress of moving. Reduced stress means reduced maintenance and costs. But perhaps the most immediate benefit we can garner from this technology is reduced noise. With no noisy combustion or rotating aerodynamic surfaces during a air, these planes are like gliding pals that characteristic military contractors will be eager to take advantage of. 
just but with current limitations, this may take right. some time to come to market. Tanks, Let's investigate how this new technology road. works Sometimes. and where it needs to improve in um, order to compete with current so technology. Kind of steel this technology has been time. in development for decades yeah, now, yeah, with many spacecraft already using that. variations on uh, the idea to achieve well, highly efficient just thrust just systems. Because These engines work on a similar principle to the iron propulsion of the MIT plane, albeit in a very different environment that lends itself to new technology. Take the NSTAR ion or the now retired tanks spacecraft. For space for an aircraft to this spacecraft uses xenon as a propellant drums, because it has a high that atomic that mass, waves, allowing it to provide more kick on. per atom. While being you know, inert and, like and having a high storage density, lending itself to long-term storage on a spacecraft. The, the engine releases both xenon atoms and high-energy electrons into the ionization chamber, where they collide to produce a positive xenon atom and more electrons. These electrons are then collected by the positively charged chamber walls, while the positive xenon atoms migrate towards the chamber exit, which contains two grids, a positive grid called the screen grid and a negative grid called the accelerator grid. The high electrical potential between these grids causes the positive ion to This was a um, positive grid and negative grid. They're just like wafers, but they're doing it wrong. You know, if you change the design, you can increase the output. Accelerate. It's only going at 145,000 kilometers an hour, but you can change this design and produce more energy and thrust. And so that's what they're doing wrong. See, this ion engine here only has two wafers. This is the ion propulsion from five years ago. Uh, so yeah, oh my bad. Spacecraft already using Three variations on the idea to we achieve to highly efficient thrust systems. systems. These engines work on a similar principle to so, the iron propulsion of the MIT plane. So, I'll, I'll update y'all. We, we already have the engine to navigate through space and actually to lift off the Earth. It just came back to an energy source. And now we have the energy source. It's fusion tech. <laughs> Europe's future space travel uh, is becoming super fast. <laughs> We're uh, already there. So here's ion propulsion leaving the Earth's atmosphere. We can actually use it to fly. Flies... Um, Oh, I'm trying to fly that. That's right here. So, iron propulsion is incredible. Just um, <laughs> people understand. So, here's the working model that shows you that with iron propulsion, there's actually. It, it's literally just moving the existing air ions out of the way. <laughs> so, now here's the working model. Where now it's ion propulsion. We're moving ions. Now we can see the same tech for a battleship, or someone's flying skateboard, or someone's flying shoes, or someone's flying car. But it'll be an, an AC an aircraft or an SC an, a spacecraft. So your family can now leave Earth and go into space and come back. But it's gonna it's gonna be, it's gonna be it needs to be done with AI. If you're navigating different stratospheres, you can't you can't put the average person in a in a spacecraft and they don't know how to fly. So the AI will have to fly. It'll be zero car accidents. It's coming super fast. Technology is coming super fucking fast. This is five years ago in the United States. So Star Wars is already here, people. This is the ion propulsion. You know Star Wars, how spacecraft take off and leave for space? This is it. <laughs> Star Wars. You get in a spacecraft and you leave like the planes are flying in space. This is the tech. This is the ion propulsion flight. So we can build battleships, have ion engines like in Star Wars, and lift battleships out of the rockets into space and build giant commercial cruise liners to evacuate like 100 million, 200, 300 million people, 400 million people, but it's better to just have everyone have their own spacecraft or aircraft so that they can leave the planet in case someone has a plane. See what I'm saying? But in the meantime, if you do that, like say an asteroid's going to hit Earth, we should at least have space colonies, you know, far enough out and close enough, close enough and far enough out and out of like different trajectory zones. So basically, the space stations have to sit outside of the Earth's gravity, um, Probably somewhere past the moon. Like, what? Yeah. Like, human space stations will have to stay in their own kind of orbit around the sun, but outside of the Earth's rotation. So, eventually, you're going to have, like, the Earth. Like, imagine this is, like, the Earth. Imagine this is the moon. Twice the distance to human colonies in space. You see what I'm saying? So, as the Earth rotates, imagine the moon's right here and the Earth's right here. Imagine they're rotating, you know, around the sun, and, and the moon just kind of goes like this. Right? But our colonies can sit, imagine the Earth and the Moon, imagine the tips of my finger, right? I'll do this, I'll do this for the Moon, this makes more sense. <laughs> is, that, is that right? 
something like that. Oh, more like this. I think it's more like this. This is the Earth one, though. Okay. I forget the size right. You can't see myself. Oh no, you can't see it. Here's the here's the Earth and Moon. Earth of the Orange Moon is this little piece of coin in it. We don't even need coins anymore. Um, as the Earth and Moon are traveling around the sun, doing this in synchronous orbit, about twice the distance, a little bit further out, we have human space models right here, orbiting around the sun too. You know, or just orbit around the sun too. Moon, Earth, twice the distance, Earth models. That's how we could be so close to each other. And more, many of the Earth, you know, you know many of the Earth at an angle of doing this. So that's why I said it was a camp at an angle. A little spin. But even the Earth, check this out. If you map and read out from space with better satellites, you realize that the Earth, the fact that it's canted, is sitting on another energy signature. And it's the well of, um, of negative ions. It's like a bed of negative ions. People thought, what is gravity? It's, it's just the collapsing of negative ions. And so the Earth isn't like this. The Earth is almost like this. But because it's doing that, it's sitting on a bed of negative ions. Spinning around the sun. Almost like pointed out like this. Spinning around the sun, pointing like this. Like like it's like it's going down a um, a cyclone. Like it's going down a cyclone. It's actually just rolling across a bed of negative ions. A massive well. And that's being propelled through uh, the negative and positive ions of our sun, which is so massive. We're in its magnetic field. <laughs> the, the, our sun is generating such a, mag a massive magnetic field. Basically, all of the uh, negative ions are collapsing, all the positive ions are pushing out. The positive ions, you're also getting photons hitting us. That's the Earth spinning. Doing spinning, doing spinning like this. The moon is just in Jurassic orbit. But we can join that same orbit if we're just twice the distance outside of it. We start going to space column. But we need the material from the asteroid belt to not destroy the Earth and our atmosphere and people on it. So sorry. <laughs> so yeah, that's why those individuals that are into uh, mining, if you're into coal, or you're doing steel mining, whatever, we need their skill sets in spacesuits, in ships, going 40 days out, about 30. You know what's good? We can get to the asteroid belt, like in between 34 to like 40 days. Some. Some, I think some people said 44, 45 days, but we can get there in 34 days the fastest, or on average, like 37. People are like, what? You don't understand. We're traveling through space, there's anomalies that happen. Like new asteroids coming through our system, new asteroids flying through our solar system, uh, solar flares, like so much stuff happens. You might have to veer course. This brilliant young woman, 10 years ago, teenager, designed uh, another AI system to navigate the stars. I guarantee you, it's great to see young teenagers with that kind of skill set and love for space because then I bet she kept working and sharpening her her, her program, her kit, her AI, whatever she had developed to, that allows, she, like, before we were even doing it, I remember these years ago, uh, like just like 10 years ago, she was like 14, she like programmed to, to have an app or AI allow spacecraft to navigate their solar system. So I guarantee you she still loved science and spacecraft and all that, just in general. Well, someone refined her work and made it better, but 10 years later, I bet she's still either working on it or perfecting it. Um, to her now spacecraft, and hopefully make that tech commercial, you know, well, it's up to her, but you know, I, I think it's good for the family to have a giant foundation where they generate billions of dollars because they, they're like the founding family of space navigation. You know what I mean? Like, if you're the founding family of space navigation, own it. I understand they want to make the technology free, but you generate billions of dollars and make money off the idea that you created. See what I'm saying? And I remember that. I kept thinking, you know, it's so weird that she created it, but I kept thinking, like, well, we weren't even in space yet. And if she holds on to the patent, then her and family are, they're set for life because they generate billions of dollars as they sell that tech to any other company that wants to navigate space. Um, so, yeah. But uh, space is here and it's coming. So, in the next 20 years, 40 years, everything we're going to be doing will be in space. That's why Space Force was brought up now. Well, Space Force was built like years ago I think during the Trump administration because it was already inevitable it wasn't a Trump thing it was just like a hey y'all we're going into space really fast we're building a spacecraft and we're gonna have drones and droids and AI and ion propulsion this ion propulsion right here makes Star Wars a reality this ion propulsion right here allows you to have your uh, 
be a Harvard motorcycle. This ion propulsion here allows you to have uh, your spacecraft that leaves your garage and you can do fly to work. And the AI, and AI picks up and drops it at work. And AI picks up and drops it for the kids and no one complains. And AI picks up the husband and picks up the wife and picks up the kids and everyone's flying back home together in their AI controlled ion propulsion unlimited energy vehicle that lasts the entire family. It's completely different. The industry will not grow. It'll have you know a set amount of makers. Because when you design an energy a vehicle, an aircraft that can last multiple generations of family use, you need less people making the spacecraft. But rich people, electric people will still want like fat, fancy spacecraft to have like handcrafted leather in it. But the average working day people are just gonna want it's gonna be plastic. Very utilitarian. People are what? When you get into the family spacecraft aircraft, um, the majority is going to be plastic because they know the seats are going to get beat up. Moms and dads know that the seats get beat up. The kids scratching everything. Stains on the... Uh, if everything's plastic, people are like, what? How do you make it comfy? You can actually ergonomically design a chair to be plastic and make it like really comfy. You can literally make an ergonomic um, plastic chair that has like fake kind of bumps into it and it helps distribute the weight away from the body. So imagine a plastic chair shaped like a video game chair but it's just... The, the sheer plastic shape, the round shapes are actually distributing force away from the body. It's actually comfier. And it's, and it's easier to clean it. There's any spills, you're drinking something, coffee in the morning, kids dropping sticky gum. It's actually gum with like sticky parts. Right it's not eating gum anymore. Uh, but like, you know, crumbs or cereal, milk, spilling on the plastic, everything, instead of spacecraft, you can just wash it out. Parents will love it. Trust me. Like a mom and dad would be like, bro, my spacecraft, I could just open the door and just spray it with water. Because all the electronics are waterproof, and I have an AI. You just open the door and just spray water and everything, and the kids make a mess. It's pretty good. No more vacuums. That's why in Star Wars, people are like scratching their head, like, dude, why do they have plastic stuff everywhere? And metal, because it's easier to clean. Once you become a mom and a dad, you'll understand. <laughs> the kids has crayons everywhere for like, you know, or there's like cookie crumbs everywhere, there's sand everywhere. You're just like, Dude, I wish everything was plastic and waterproof electronics. So I could just kind of wash the interior of the car and, you know, and have like a you know, brush or whatever, you know, and brush the handles or everything. Or you're going to have a droid and do it. You know, droid, droid's going to clean the fucking shit for you. Like, okay. So, uh, and you're going to have family droids too. And treat, treat the droids with respect. You know, you're going to have droids that are going to have AIs that are going to be with your family for like generations and whatnot. Um, treat them with respect. <laughs> you know? Um, Droids are our friend. You know, uh, not that big of AI, but droids are our friend. I think it's just the, the the mechanisms of the fact that it'll be flying and blinking. You know, it could have like a little silver gunmetal, like green eyes floating, like a little droid. You know, have an AI. And then it's great for repositories. It's great for intellectuals, too. Because then you have like a notebook, you have a recording device, uh, and you can bounce feedback off of and correct and sharpen your ideas. And the AI can then just talk to other AIs. The AI can cycle through the world's history and help you finish problems and equations and whatnot. And people are like, well, how do you still do school? Well, school will still be effective in needing. How you do in school is just uh, oral presentation. You know, you can't have... And people are like, what? Well, if you're writing written content, your droid or your AI can then just write or kind of for you. The future of school will have to be just like oral content in terms of um, speaking. Oral content, more speaking content. So you'd be in class, and you can read stuff, and you have to be able to kind of, you know, recite what you learn, recite what you know, but also speak your mind. Hey, what you're learning, what you know. Because you can't, the elimination of, like, doing homework will probably go away. And I hear a resounding, like, cheer, homework going away, a resounding cheer of, like, tens and tens of thousands of people. Because everyone between kids to teenagers to adults are in school. A resounding cheer at like the end of homework because of AI. People looking around like, "What? You'll be in the class, right? You'll have your assistant drone, your droid, and all that, and you're gonna be learning and growing either way." And instructors there just to guide you, not to punish you. They guide you. You learn these concepts correctly. You understand this math. You understand this biology. You understand this grammar. You don't understand it. You just you have your AI droid you talk to. You have your AI probably assistant at school. 
probably each person deaf should probably have a digital AI assistant also helping them, and an instructor to help them. And now no one gets left behind. Instead of one instructor with 30 students, which I was a part of that, one instructor and like 37 students, I was a part of that. So we got left behind because an instructor just didn't have time teaching everybody. And even after school, they're sacrificing time away from their family and kids to help teach these massive classes. But it's not enough. So as the human population increases, I'm sorry teachers, but we will need digital AI teachers to fill in the gaps that no students are left behind ever again. And it will be a, a resounding yes from all families in America. So I'm sorry. I'll give you all the numbers. But when AI jobs, when AI jobs come and they replace professors, they will also replace school teachers. But there will still be schools where people will pay for school teachers because they're still going to want that interaction. And I think it'll work in tandem. I still think there should be a homeroom teacher who helps guide the class and an AI that assists, but then there'll probably also be some private schools that'll just, a lot of private schools have a lot of money, they're just gonna let all their instructors go and have digital AI instructors to guide them. But I guarantee public school will, will, will stand steadfast and still have in, in class teachers. Uh, we should codify that, make policy to make sure that that is ever required. That the 50% of the digital instructors and 50% have to be uh, physical instructors and there will always be like just make it a public a public policy right for all public schools you, they're gonna have an AI teacher in the room they're gonna have a real teacher in the room and now guess what the AI teacher is in, impartial but also should stand for justice and democracy and your AI should basically just kind of check to make sure the teacher is teaching democracy and is impartial but if the AI is recording the teacher and the teacher starts spewing off racist stuff or can also record and see if the teacher is abusing any of the students or the students are abusing the teacher and it works in tandem. And then the parents should be able to always, you know what parents can do? Parents can then be able to like look through the video feed of what the AI is seeing and speaking to the class. So now all parents, they can be at work and they can check in on their kid. They're not saying anything, but they can just like, they said the AI will be in the classroom, say it's like sixth grade classroom, sixth grade teacher, and the AI is also teaching, and the teacher will teach parents from their workplace and always will bring up their cell phone and kind of see how their children's doing in the class. But I hope that doesn't like put any pressure on kids because all the kids just realize you're not even really seeing your parents you're seeing like an AI teacher and I sit on a desk and you're just kind of learning and a lot of it's through books or digital ebooks and you're just kind of reciting and speaking your mind if you don't understand the concept you should always be just kind of raising your hand and asking your AI to get better but then you just you, you're always in a whole other culture for American teaching you know? so um, it's not too bad it's, it'll probably be welcomed but also the resounding cheer like tens and tens of thousands of people cheering ain't no more homework because really school and lectures and university shit. Everything should be just kind of overland class. For the arts, we already know. You, we need the kilns. We need the clay. We need the giant digital pad or the paper or the charcoal. We still need some analog stuff like that for artists because those schools and techniques, people, st people still want to buy it. That makes sense. Like our painters that dedicate four years of life to become fine art painters, uh, the women and men that I know, their skill is invaluable. They're creating one of one works of art that are beautiful. You know, three weeks, four weeks, three weeks, four weeks, eight hours each day creating a painting and they sell it to like, you know, they have a buyer, right? The buyer kind of loves their artwork and they're like, give them a concept. The artist will do like a, a watercolor rendition or a sketch rendition with like a color pencil, like this is what the painting's gonna look like. And the person's like, I wanna buy that. And then you do the painting. You get paid in advance, artists get paid. Painters, painters and illustrators get paid up front. So they pay their rent, get food and all that. And then they make the painting for three or four weeks and get paid a lot of money, thousands and thousands of dollars. Cause they're making one of one, Taking up, taking up 30 days or even longer. Sometimes the painting can be eight weeks. Sometimes the painting is four months. See you know what I'm saying? People are like, how's the painting four months? And someone wants to, uh, like I had a friend of mine, I won't say his name. First name is Larry Hurst, but I can't even, can't even say that. Good guy, great dude, can't say his name. But to protect his identity and all, but he's in New York, has his own art gallery. And I told him before, I was like, bro, what's the longest painting you did? I think he said like it was like four months or something. The client pays the front, of course. He has four months, he has this massive painting. You know, I think he said it was 13 feet by eight feet. 13 feet by eight feet took like four months. You get paid up front for those four months. Giant chunks of money. And basically you get one giant chunk the first month, one giant chunk from the client. The, you know, the fourth month, one giant, you know, the fourth month you get another giant kind of check to do this painting with. Because you're taking up so much of their life. You're paying for the fact that you're, you're occupying that artist for like four months of his life. That's what, you, that's what that premium price is. In the, tens of thousands, right? And you do a painting like that. So those skills will still be needed, but when it comes to like mining, we're gonna have like droids. When it comes to building cars, you're gonna have robots building cars. 
definitely better than bipedal robots that are just build cars better than humans can efficiently without human injury you can have uh, robots that can uh, you have an AI robot check this out you're going to have droid security too it's just it's better for shipyards so those tankers can be AI automated tankers or boats but then you can have droids as security uh, guarding especially 24 7 not for security on like a on like a massive kind of aircraft or tanker or a tanker craft or some kind of tanker craft moving lots of goods but you probably always need um what's it called oh oh sorry people are texting me do I have myself wrong right now Oh, but yeah, with this uh, tech, go watch the video, do your thing, good stuff. Oh, the Star Wars tech is here. So this is your floating skateboard, this is your floating shoes, this is your flying car, this is your family spacecraft RV that can leave Earth and go to space. You have a vehicle that'll pick up dad, pick up, pick up mom, pick up dad, pick up the kids at school, and they're all flying home. No one has to fly, the AI is flying it. Uh, vector control, thrust engines, all the propulsion units for more power to get to navigate. This is ion propulsion in itself is beautiful and brilliant. But once you incorporate it with a uh, plasma engine and a fusion engine and a fusion generator and a vector plus engine, you can generate more power to have like, you know, what was that? Uh, like X-Wings. And like TIE Fighters, basically. The TIE Fighters are the exact same thing. The TIE Fighter, TIE Fighter is basically this, but two of them side by side and then going on the other vertical direction. Do you understand? You know Star Wars, like a TIE Fighter, has two giant wafers, two giant wafers, and like a center cockpit, just on the vert, it's changed. They flip it the other way. That's a TIE Fighter. And then the X-Wing is taking the existing um, units and just spreading the wings out. So the X-Wing is literally taking this panel going up, taking this panel going down, taking this panel going up, going up just to kind of open up its weapon base. That's what makes it more efficient. People are like, what? So instead of opening the bottom of the bay and like firing at missiles, when they open the wings, the missiles should be inside the wings. And they fire, they launch out. They go. <laughs> and then it can close its wings and hide its digital signature. Okay. So in terms of X-Wing design for like military spacecraft or flight or And then Star Wars is really just two wafers and it's just shifting, and, and it's more agile and stable because when you have two giant wafers in the cockpit, <laughs> like when you have a TIE fighter cockpit and two giant wafers, what it's doing is it can shift so many ions in such a controlled manner, like that giant square is shifting ions in, a, in an intense direction away from the ship, and that's why they're so agile. Incredibly powerful. You're putting on a lot of G's to your body, like, You know, as you're trying to navigate and trying to fight, like you're trying to dogfight like that, as you're, you're putting so much force in your body so quickly versus uh, any kind of X-Wing, you're going to kind of glide into your you know, combat zones. You're, you're fighting inside of out of a wake, you're going to top. Those are flying. Yeah. <laughs> versus those top fighters, like it's not in a square and it's projecting out so many ions in a controlled direction. Mm -hmm. So it could just shift like much faster. Just from a Star Wars perspective, but the same thing with the tech itself. You know, you're gonna have your uh, floating skateboards, your floating shoes, your floating your flying car, and our battleships that are pretty floating too. So you can generate enough power now with fusion generators, your fusion tech energy. Basically, with fusion tech, we can, we can generate limited energy, and now we know where to put it. Use it to propel more ions. Because the, the limiting the limiting thing was the power source. We d we developed the engines years ago. The limiting thing was the power source. <laughs> we already had the tech. <laughs> the tech is old. Our energy is old. It's just limiting source of the power source. So batteries kept getting better and more dense, the whole more energy could burn. 
Jillian was gonna manufacture with the battery, but guess what? We don't need the battery anymore because that was just the energy source. People kept thinking batteries are storage. No, with fusion generation tech, by fusion tech, we have unlimited energy now. We don't need a battery. The limited energy just needs to be concentrated and directed. Both the positive. Ion engines will now have unlimited energy. Now you're just directing the proportion of the ion energy, more of it, to your vector thrust energy. And of course, the other parts that you need. Just heads up, and for posterity, so in the future, when people see this, they can uh, understand. Look at to the I average sometimes five people, and sometimes I average like ten people, and they just try to. Oh, well, I'm not saying they're hiding, but I mean, yeah, it's, that's what they do. I'm only at two hours and forty-five minutes in the stream, so there's always like five people on average, but ten people on average. Ten. Oh wait, who is this? Oh no, I already gave a shout out to. 13 Mary, so 1, 3, M, and Z. Uh, what's it oh, yeah, so it's coming. So flying cars, flying skateboards. Uh, we eliminate all cars from Planet Zero. Um, are we just kind of hot? Oh, it's definitely not getting Gives 13, 17 years. We need to try to the warehouse, to the grocery store, to the restaurant size, to the house size, to the car size, to the size. Gives 13, 17 years. We already have iron now. Just the power source wants that. People are like, what? So the, the first generation of kind of flying skateboards and flying shoes will be like, probably using battery with ion engines and vector thrust engines and faster, but um, the fusion, the fusion takes coming fast. So I, I'll take that back. I would say battery probably have like 17 year run at max. <laughs> people kind of realize it, like what? So co company people people companies are wasting time putting money into batteries. Realize that once we perfect and miniaturize fusion tech, we have unlimited energy. You don't need batteries. But take that back. You know what? You probably still need batteries. But battery tech needs to get better because it's a waste of weight. You're gonna have you're gonna have an aircraft that can just be lighter and not have a battery. Still have a safe which is safety mechanisms, better safety mechanisms, more storage. Because half the ship, or a quarter of the ship, or even 10% of the ship won't be weighed down in, uh, by batteries. Like right now, the problem is, if you had a, a battery electric aircraft, even if the whole underbelly of the aircraft and the wings had batteries, the aircraft's too heavy and build more lift. Because uh, the density of the battery's too much. So this is what makes it so incredible. That normally, when you remove the battery weight, you have unlimited energy from the fusion generation, you know, fusion generation tech engine. Then uh, the engine itself is going to weigh way less than a whole bunch of fucking batteries, and you can then have the propulsion to lift people in the aircraft. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> so uh, it's quite incredible, quite, quite remarkable. But, uh, that's why batteries. I'm telling you right now, batteries probably have 17 years at max. And people are like, what? Every three to four years, we have a breakthrough in tech. It's the next thing. 13 to 17 years. In 16 years, we'll have either four breakthroughs or we'll have three breakthroughs in 12 years by the 13th year. Trust me, we'll have miniaturized the tech. <laughs> so it's coming. And when you have a fusion generation cell, okay, when you have a, a fusion cell generator with the size of your cell phone, thickness width, and you have like six of them inside the drawer, you can make it just, uh, and you know, have its own uh, a fusion cell kind of capsule for like a center console or whatever is battery pack or three battery packs or six of those battery packs, then it could just last forever and generate more power and do more things. Um, it could eventually, the droid can fly. So it can lift more objects. Uh, the steel and, and pistons, <laughs> steel and pistons can move a lot of shit. A droid made of steel and pistons can lift a ton of fucking weight. <laughs> you know, um, literally, you know, uh, probably two, probably two, steel piston fusion cell droid could probably lift up an aircraft just two maybe four but probably two could do it but you probably do four just to start out like one for each corner probably lift up the spacecraft because the steel and the steel and pistons you know guiding a droid and a bunch of pistons and steel and electronics with uh, fusion uh, you know 
fusion cells it's going to be more of a capsule it's easy easy use you know transportation it's round shape reduces damage uh, capsules are just better i think it's just a capsule in general um just the design itself even if it falls it you know rolls and dissipates energy from it i think it's kind of square or bulky it'll like hit an edge or a corner and kind of crumple so um yeah just, just a heads up the fusion cells in the cells can have rings with <laughs> either way it's better better be safer design I think. and then on top of that even if it's a capsule shape you can still have steel like a steel jacket outside your fusion cell so that no matter what and make it a uh, uh, a titanium steel or tungsten steel tungsten steel titanium steel uh, uh, mesh or bracket or cage around the around the fusion cell um, and it can also be in the shape of another like cylinder basically so the main fuel cell would be in a capsule shape and then another jacket shell or mesh that's a titanium steel or tungsten steel um, shell as a capsule on the outside of it that will further protect it or will perfectly protect it and make sure it has like markers and extra hinges so that it can dock and slide and the units or you know it can dissipate or like separate you know different parts but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's coming so here's the tech here's your Flying cars, flying skateboards right here. Hold out of bullshit. And it's just uh, here's the energy source at this time. That's all it is. Science, baby. <laughs> Star Wars is here. <laughs> oh my god. Bum, 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 bum. Oh my god. I don't know what I can. Oh, okay. What the heck? It's also cool. It's also 5 a.m. in the morning and I'm just legit tired. <laughs> I am just legit tired. Yeah. It's the Bay is in a very so, different environment that lends so itself to the technology. Whoa. This oh episode God. of Real Engineering oh is brought to you by Skillshare. Oh, Go into the folds and turn website layouts into an art form with Wix Studio. This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Skillshare, home to over 20,000 classes that could teach you a new life skill. Last month, MIT revealed their ion-propelled plane. The product of seven years of development. Oh, that's a bad design. The one that I just showed you earlier is the <laughs> better design. Well, better design, but just, you know, uh, this one. Some of hard landing. Definitely gonna want uh, land softer. Roswell flight test crew here at Commercial UAV Expo 2020. I, I couldn't believe this thing you were showing us could act. The thrust in a desired way that, that we that we want. Now, how do you do the things that all drones have to do, like control movement and the pitch roll and yaw axis? How do you do that? Well, there's a lot of technologies that go into this, and uh, you know I can only give you so much without charging you know, a lot of money. But uh, so, so we use uh, different techniques. Uh, one of them is is controlling the different quad 18 inches. I am thank so much for sharing it with us All right. today. This is the Roswell. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. It's not there yet. Oh, my bad. Okay, I'll check it. That's a success. This is both a wing and an ionic thruster in one. And it might just be a step in the right direction. You see, for the better part of a year, I've been trying to optimize an ionic thruster for flight. And after I designed my first BSI thruster, it set in motion a transatlantic battle. Responding across the ocean, my friend and fellow creator Joel designed his own ionic thruster. No, 
the thruster that works is just the power source. So now we have unlimited energy. We can put more ionic energy. You also need just bigger wafers. Bigger wafers of plastic. Uh, <laughs> oh, bigger wafers of copper. Yeah, also bigger wafers of plastic and uh, unlimited energy source with their fusion tech. Oh yeah, so how ion thrusters work. 100 plus kilometers a second. Decent, but the thing that's stopping it is the power source that we just now Magnetic turbine. <laughs> Still. This is not a plasma plus, a little bit different. Nice good work. Oh, the repel with my sneeze. <laughs> These I never about giving you. to be showing you how to make an ion propulsion jet. What if there was a way to create thrust or lift without any moving parts and without high temperature? Well, it is possible through ionic propulsion or ionic thrust. So first, let me explain how I'm creating the wind that's going to generate the thrust. Now, if you just have two electrodes that have the same geometry like this, the electric field on both sides of these is going to look about the same. If you look at the electric field lines, they're going to look about like this. So whether you're on this side or this side, the strength of the electric field is about the same. But that all changes if we put something pointy on one of the electrodes. So let's say I wrap some aluminum foil around this with a pointy end right here. Now, because of the point right here, the electric field is going to be more concentrated around the point than on this end. So now we kind of have an asymmetrical electric field going on. It's stronger on this side than on this side. And because it's really strong at the point right here, what it can do is it can actually rip some electrons off of the air molecules around it. And once it rips an electron off an air molecule, let's say we have a positive oxygen molecule, now it's going to want to move to the negative side, but on the way, because there's other air molecules around it, it's going to bump into those air molecules. And so it's going to get recoiled and bounce back the other way, but it's going to push some neutral molecules this way. So what that means is if we ionize some air molecules, it's going to create a generic neutral wind that gets pushed this way. Now the wind is not charged, it's neutral, but it's going to get propelled from oh. the ions hitting them. And because the moving ions recoil and go back towards the positive, it's going to create some thrust on this electrode here. So it actually is going to push it a little bit because those positive ions are moving towards a positive electrode and that electric field will kind of push it a little bit. So the physics behind it is you're throwing neutral wind this way and it's pushing against the electrode this way. And this wind is so strong, I can actually blow out a candle with it. Let me show you. Okay, so I'm gonna light a candle right behind this <laughs> electrode here. I think you actually got it wrong. I think the, the positive ions are being generated so the negative ionic force is pushing against it. It's not neutral air. <laughs> it's the literal seismic force of positive ions pushing one way, floating away, and negative ions collapsing. And they're moving in opposite direction. And that thrust, that, that those two forces colliding, negative ions and positive ions, they bounce off each other's resonance at the same frequency. So check out because of the frequency of the energy signature. So the Earth has an energy signature. And you can match the energy signature. And then your objects can just literally float away from the Earth's atmosphere using the natural uh, ionic force against itself to propel yourself away and it pushes objects away. You can generate enough positive ions to lift heavier objects from the atmosphere. So Star Wars is here. And check this out, the sun has an energy signature. So you can match your frequency of your ionic energy to the sun and then just kind of uh, what do they call it? You're gonna kind of you're you're not warp jumping. You're in, I don't know how to describe it. Like almost like skipping. <laughs> when you say skipping, I don't know. Solar solar riding. You should say solar riding. Maybe solar riding. Solar skipping. Solar sailing. Oh, you're just you're bouncing off of the solar winds of the sun. And but your vessel will start flying really fucking fast. And we don't have like warp travel, but essentially what we're doing is we're just using our ionic engines to bounce off stars. And also you produce enough ionic engines you can go really fucking fast, really fucking far. So Star Wars is, give us like 20, 20, 40 years. 20 years you'll have some more working concepts. 
you know, 40 years while they saw me. Yeah. I mean, because people are like, what? Okay, 13 to 17 years, we can miniaturize the tech. So that's going to be 20 years. And another 20 years and 40 years, we'll have more spacecraft and aircraft. And then saw 